live stream of our church, Wiltshire Baptist Church, and um, we welcome you. And thank you for waiting, and thank you for uh, giving your comments and uh, likes and greetings. Uh, you know, giving your greetings to our members, your to your friends, but most especially, thank you for sharing also our, our uh, regular program, not just Fridays, but every Sunday. We always go to a live uh, streaming. Um, although our church is open <clears throat> for in-person worship uh, service, uh, we still do the live stream during the time, and um, we thank you for your uh, continuous uh, support and love and prayers and, and, and just you know, having wonderful people like you watching us uh, every time. Um, we would like to, first of all, um, uh, greet some people who had the birthdays. Uh, October is a big month for birthdays. So we would like to greet uh, <clears throat> uh, for this week, coming week. Uh, yesterday was Nila Valencia's birthday and then Samantha Cruz, happy birthday. Also, uh, Aldo Ray Taneo, uh, Robin Lee Govan, happy birthday to these people, uh, wonderful people. And in the Philippines, happy birthday to our friend, my friend, our friend, uh, Florence Tika Isidoro and uh, Pastor Edward Isidoro. And uh, Alain De Leon, Sherlyn Ann Padua, happy birthday. Ethan Gonzalez, uh, Kuya Ben Ocampo in the Philippines, and Connie Eldridge, happy birthday to all of you. And the rest of the Octoberians, we will greet uh, next time uh, on our program. But again, thank you. We are so, uh, you know, just, just joyful for you people that are just lovely. You're just uh, faithful to the Lord. And at the same time, I would like to extend uh, our deepest uh, you know, sympathy, our condolences to the family of the Perez family in the Philippines. One of our faithful viewers, uh, Dr. Lynn Roca Perez, has got to be with the Lord. She passed away. She uh, lost the battle with cancer, but she won many hearts while she was here, and most especially salvation in Jesus Christ while she was here. She was my classmate in optometry in CEU. Uh, we graduated at the same time. She was faithful uh, working with us in our clinics and just just a godly uh, woman in the Lord. So uh, brother Eugene and all the children and family, we extend our uh, prayers, our love, that God will comfort you. Right in the Philippines, I think she has a <clears throat> a wake. Um, uh, I'm not sure of the place, but um, you, you could contact us or the family regarding that. All right, and also the same token, we are praying for uh, uh, Brother Herman Hibbler. We're praying for you, and also uh, Sister Lorna Imelo, and all the many names in our prayer list. By the way, we prayed earlier. We prayed earlier instead of praying after the service. Our prayer team and our church are praying before this live stream. We, we kind of change the format um, and, and uh, hopefully that many more will join in our prayer group. Okay? Now as we go to our Bible study for tonight, <coughs> you know we've been studying the parables, the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we had an exciting uh, journey through these parables by um, Luke chapter 15 uh, regarding the lost and found department in the Bible, in the New Testament. And this is when the Lord Jesus Christ being confronted by the religious people during his time, the Pharisees, the scribes, because he was mingling with sinners and, and, and tax collectors. Uh, people who are uh, looked down upon uh, in society by those you know, during that time. And so Jesus gave this parable, Luke 15, just to share that how important it is that, that you win the lost at any cost. How important it is that Jesus came to seek this and to save uh, that uh, which was lost. So we learned about the lost sheep. We learned about the lost coin or silver. We, we learned about last time the lost uh, son or the prodigal son. But do you know that 
part of that parable that Jesus shared in Luke chapter 15, which is one of the longest parables that Jesus shared, is a, you know, it didn't end with just the lost son returning to of the parable. We learn something very important and it reminds us of us. It reminds us of the people that are probably members of church, members of a church and, and, and Christians. And let me share with you the last part of Luke chapter 15 uh, verses uh, 25 and following. And this is what the Bible said. Now, when they were having a feast, remember, the prodigal son returned, the father embraced him and, and, and killed the fatted calf, and there were celebrations, you know, my son was, was dead and is now alive, was lost and now found. While the merriment was going on, apparently the older son who came from the field, and he didn't know why there was a party, like there, there was music and dancing, and this is what the Bible said, coming from the field, so he heard the, the celebration, and so he, this is what happened. And his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, celebration. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Wait, what's happening? He, he said to the servant, hey, come here. What's the, what's the merriment? Well, why is there a celebration? In verse 27, the Bible said, and he said to him, oh, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Big time for celebration. And this is how the brother reacted. Okay, This is how the brother reacted. And from this story, we learn several things. Now, number one, he was angry. Now, remember, his brother has been lost for a while and uh, gone and, and presumed to be dead or presumed to be not returning anymore but his reaction was this and he was angry and would not go in meaning he don't want to join the celebration he want to be outside of the merriment he want to be outside of the thanksgiving celebration therefore since he wouldn't come in his father came out and pleaded with him probably one of the servants said uh, sir your, one of the, your eldest son is waiting outside. He doesn't want to come in. Something's wrong. He, he, he is angry. So here's the start of the story. So many things that are lost. The prodigal son returned. But we want to study tonight on the topic of the lost sibling. The lost older brother. Or, or you know, uh, uh, the, the lost sibling. So what can we learn here? Well, first of all, this shows us a picture or the mark of what a carnal Christian could be. Now, you may have been saved. You may have been in the family of God. You may have been uh, even a um, part of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, you're not the prodigal son. You're not the lost sheep anymore. You're not the lost coin anymore. <coughs> so, but this tells us something. You can still be a carnal Christian in spite of not being a prodigal son. You could be a prodigal brother. All right. So what can we learn here? The most, uh, <clears throat> the most uh, 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 shocking, the most shocking thing that happened here was first of all the brother's resentment. The brother, the brother's resentment. Now notice here. He returned, the father and all the servants were celebrating in the house. And when he returned, instead of being happy as they are, instead of being joyful as the dad, as the uh, people there are, he had resentment. Now, what is resentment? Resentment is something like this. The definition is a bitter indignation at having been treated 
unfairly. See the point? His resentment was manifested because, hey, something is wrong here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The, 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 my brother who, who spent all the money, who got his inheritance and, and rudely asked his part of the inheritance from my father, now returned and you're having a party? And here I am, I came from the field and, and nobody gave me a party. So that's called resentment. You're angry because something is unfair. And many times, you know, in life, things seems to be, seems to be unfair, right? You look at things and it seems like life is so unfair that, that uh, uh, you don't deserve what you're getting through right now. What you feel right now, you don't deserve this. You, you are better uh, than others and yet it seems like you were treated unfairly. So this is something that we could uh, learn. The Bible said, we see his resentment when he said, he answered and said to his father. Now remember, the father has to come out. These many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me even a young goat. And yet here, here you are killing a fatted calf. So that I could enjoy it with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, now notice the resentment, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. It's like saying, this is not fair. This is not fair. He wasted everything you have, yet you gave this party for him. Now many times remember this, even Christians have resentment. Look, I'm the one who is in church every day, and I'm the one who, I mean, it's every Sunday, I'm the one who's singing in the choir, I'm the one uh, serving you, and yet you give this crazy guy who is inconsistent in his Christian life, and you gave him a brand new car. That's unfair. That's unfair. Here am I, uh, exerting all my gift and energy to serve you, Lord, and yet others are blessed more than me. That's unfair. That's called resentment. That is one of the first feeling that comes when you know you're about to backslide or you know that you're already backslidden. You have this uh, feeling of unfair. Life is unfair and I am not treated properly. So that's a resentment. But now we need to understand the reality. What's really happening here? Uh, was he... Um, justified in what he said it seems like right was he uh, 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 right in, in his view of the things that are happening so now let's see the reality okay here's the reality uh, the father did not do anything wrong you have a son that was lost and now that he's back every father would be happy he did not do anything wrong. But the reality, there's something wrong with the elder brother. There's something wrong in his life. And here's the reality. Number one, he has a problem. Okay? And the problem is in his spirit. There's nothing wrong with the celebration. There's nothing wrong with everything the father did, the giving the robe, the, the sandals, the ring. But the thing is, there is something wrong in the spirit of the elder son. Well, the first thing that you could see is his spirit of anger. He's an angry man. The Bible said, but he was angry. Instead of rejoicing with them, instead of, of being happy that at least his brother was back, at least his father now will be happy because his dad has been waiting, looking at the window almost every day. Yet, he was angry. Now, the word angry that was used here is the word that is used meaning red-faced anger. That's the original word, red-faced anger. It's like clenching your fist, hardening your face and your jaw, and like, what? That's unfair. That's the kind of anger that he has. Now, the Bible warns us. 
It is never good to have a spirit, an angry spirit in us. The Bible said in Psalm 37, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Again, in Proverbs 15, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays uh, contention. So you always get into trouble with anger. You will never be, uh, it will never be good, okay, because you always have uh, contention, you always have disagreement, you always are uh, fighting with someone. So again, the Bible said in Proverbs 22, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man, do not go. Okay, in, in Tagalog, you know, uh, in Filipino, madadamay ka. Okay, alayuan mo or, or you may mga spirito ng pagkagalit. That's not good. That's Filipino. Um, so you see, and many more verses in the Bible. I just chose these three, but there are a lot of warnings about anger in the Bible. And this eldest son had that spirit of anger in him. Not only that, he has a spirit of jealousy. Jealousy. He, he was jealous of what's happening here. The Bible said, notice what he said, as soon to the dad, as soon as this son of yours came, why did he use, you know, in, again in Tagalog, tong anak mo na ito. In, instead of saying, instead of saying, you know, my brother, why did you do this with my brother? Instead, he said, this son of yours. Now that is a term indicating that he is jealous of his younger brother. He doesn't deserve, or, you know, how he was treated, and he felt that the brother was treated so well that. He didn't even say, oh, my brother. He just said to the father, this son of yours. Right? Remember when we were angry, we do that. Remember, parents? Uh, when we are angry, uh, we tell to our spouse, yung anak mong yan. You know? And instead of saying, yung anak natin, you say, this kid of yours, this child of yours, when in fact, they are your child also. So anyway, that's a, not a good sign. There is jealousy happening here. And not only that, notice the words. Who has devoured your livelihood with harlots? You killed the fatted calf for him. And yet you never even gave me a small goat to celebrate with my friends. Yet you, you killed the fatted calf. Remember I told you last time, every farmer, uh, everyone that is taking care of cows, they reserve during that time the fatted calf. One who is groomed for the biggest celebration. One who is probably fed well, massaged well even. So the meat will be good and it is reserved for the biggest celebration. And the uh, brother has envy. He was envious. Why did you give him the most awaited dinner of all? The, the best steak in the house for the fatted cow. And yet, here am I, and you don't even do that to me. That's envy. And believe me, when you see this angry spirit, jealous spirit, envious spirit in any, and believers, okay, those that are in the church have this also, then that's a mark of a backslidden Christian. You're beginning to be, you know, out of fellowship with God. You're still a child of God. Remember, this, this brother is called a son, he's called a servant. So you're still in the family of God, but you are not enjoying your relationship with God. You're not enjoying your uh, uh, fellowship with God. Not only that, notice he has this another spirit, the judgmental spirit. Or we call this the critical spirit. How did we know that? He said to his dad, this, 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 uh, my, this son of yours who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. Now again, that's something odd, because when Jesus was sharing the story, the, you know, the, the Jesus said, "Oh, he lived his life in in debauchery. He lived his life in riotous, uh, riotous living, but there was no mention of any harlot. That is just his critical spirit thinking, probably that his brother spent his money with harlots, but it was not mentioned by Jesus." That is just his assessment. You know why? 
because he already has a critical spirit. You know, when a, when a Christian or a person has a critical or judgmental spirit, he begins to imagine things in, in his mind and analyzing things and, and uh, uh, you know, summarizing things that are not right. He doesn't not even know all the details. He hasn't even talked to the dad. He, actually, he didn't even know what happened to his brother until the brother came back. He didn't even see his brother, uh, the clothes that he wore before the robe was given to him. All he knew was the brother came back, right? And he, the brother could have returned a millionaire. The brother could have learned, you know, returned a successful person. But in his mind, because of his critical spirit, he never thought of anything good. That's what happened when a person is a judgmental, critical spirit. He sees nothing good. He wears a lens of criticism. He wears a lens. So when he wears that lens, everything he can criticize, that's what he sees. And nothing good. He could not even imagine anything good to happen. Only the bad things. All right? So here's the problem with his spirit, but also he has a problem with his own service. Now remember, he came from the field. He's right. He's doing his part. He's very... Masipag, industrious probably, he is taking care of the father's field. But notice this, okay? He has the wrong motive. He has the wrong motive. So he said in verse 29, So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. On the surface, it looks like, what's wrong with that? But you see, when he used the word serving, it's equivalent to the New Testament word doulos or bond servant. So he is actually saying to his father, I am working as hard as I can like your bond servant. I am enslaved. I am enslaved to this, to this thing that you want me to do. So to him, his service is not of the pure heart. His service is out of like enslavement. He feels enslaved. He feels like, I don't want to do this, but I have to do this because, you know, my father told me to do this. That is what's happening here. He has the wrong motive. He is not serving out of love. He is not serving out of duty to his dad. He is not serving out of, of care So because his father is old and he is thinking of many things. So I'll do this so that I'll free my dad of some burdens that he has. He's not doing with that motive he's doing with the wrong motive it's like I'm enslaving myself and yet here I am okay not even being not being treated the way you treated my uh, your prodigal son so that is the wrong motive you see when you do something for God especially your motive must be out of love must be pure because you will regret you will you, you will have resentment you will always expect something in return and, and that's not good because when you serve god serve him because he loves you serve him because you love him not because you want something in return because if you expect something in return every time you do something for god you will be disappointed that's why you will always look at the others that are experience you know better life those that are not as faithful as you and yet they receive a better life you don't know what God's plan is the Bible said uh, you know uh, <clears throat> the goodness of God leads you to repentance so maybe God wants to show his goodness so that he'll see the, the mercy of God the character of God in forgiveness we don't know God knows what he's doing so here we see the problem with this service wrong motive so when you serve and do something for God, make sure you do it because you love God. Not to show off to other people, not to show off uh, uh, you know, to, to some leaders in your, in your congregation, but you do it for God. That's the right motive. And not only that, he has a problem with his self. What's the problem with his self? Notice this. He was self-righteous. He was very self-righteous. You know, uh, to summarize what he's thinking and what he's saying, he, as if he's saying something like this, I did not do the evil things that son of yours did. Okay? 
Uh, look, he, he squandered your money. I didn't do that. You know, uh, I help in your farm. I, I, I listen to everything you, you command me to do, which are all good. But you see, now he developed a self-righteous attitude. He said, I am much, much better than that son of yours. He compared himself and looked at himself and said, I am not as evil as my brother. Is that story familiar? Remember the story in Luke 18 about the, the Pharisee, the religious leader, and the tax collector who went to the temple to pray. And the first thing the Pharisee said was, Dear God, I thank you that uh, I, I am not as bad as this person is, pointing to the tax collector. And, and you know, uh, I give my tithes, I fast uh, several times a week or a day, and, and I'm not as bad as this guy. So he's developed a self-righteous attitude. Now, it's called a holier-than-thou attitude. When, when you always have the tendency to look at yourself as, as way above in spirituality than others, then you develop self-righteous attitude. That's a wrong view of yourself. And, and everything that you do reflects that. And, and um, so many reasons that, um, you know, and even, even people around you notice that. They discern that. And so not only was he self-righteous, I'm better than my brother, but also he was self-centered. You could know and detect a person who is self-centered very well, easily. How? Notice what he said in verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I, notice that, have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. What do you notice? All those personal pronouns, you know, I, me, myself. Again, self-centeredness. It's all about him. It's all about what he did. It's all about his feeling. It's all about his, his <clears throat> assessment. It's all about him. Again, another uh, a parable is familiar with this when, when the, you know, the, the, the rich man who, who had a good harvest. Okay? I will do this. I will be like this. I will eat, drink, and be merry. All about I, I, I. So that is how you detect a person or even a Christian who is so self-centered. It's all about his project. It's all about his doing. It's all about, oh, we start. I started this. It's all about, oh, I was a part of that. It's all about I, I, I. So be careful with that. That's one another mark of a carnal believer. You never deflect the glory back to God. You never reflect the credits and the glory back to the Lord. You absorb it. I, I, I. And again, another thing is he had self-pity. Self-pity. Look, look at what you did to my brother, and here am I. Look, I, didn't, I don't even have a, a goat to celebrate with my friends. And I wonder if even, even if he has that many friends. Uh, but anyway, with that kind of attitude that I just mentioned, you will have very few friends. But anyway, he said that. Let's assume that that's true. Uh, but he had self-pity. You see, he had no reason for self-pity. No reason at all. Even if the father killed two fatted cow for, for uh, uh, the prodigal son that returned, he, the eldest son, no, have no reason to, for self-pity. Number one, he has what we call the birthright. He was the oldest son. And the birthright is a, it's a, it's a Jewish practice. The eldest son always have uh, uh, half of the inheritance, no matter how much it is. And he has the, the legal right to, pre, to assume the leadership in the family in case something happened to the father. So in a sense, he has that birthright. Remember the birthright that, he, that Esau uh, sold okay, to, uh, to his brother? He has that birthright. And that means he practically owns everything the father has. Especially when the brother, the younger brother, already got his part. 
then it, it's uh, legally speaking he owns the eldest son now owns everything the father has because the part for the sibling has already been taken out imagine you are griping about one fatted calf when you own all the sheep and the cow all the cows that the father owns you own everything in the field not only that you own even the interest and the profits that have been uh, that have occurred since your brother left and took his part so now your 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 cattle have have uh, you know have uh, grown your your field has greater harvest you have profits and and, and and interest and everything you even own that while your little brother whatever he took that's it he can never have a part or a share in the profits and interest of, of your of your uh, uh, wealth see he has no right for self-pity and yet he really is pitying himself so what can we learn here number one his younger brother left their home the bible said and traveled to a far country and wasted everything he has that's a prodigal son but you know the problem with this older brother this older brother stayed home physically but was wandering far in his heart and forgot everything so his younger brother wasted everything but this older brother forgot everything that's why he was wallowing in anger and pity and, and judgment. And, and see the problem here? The younger brother went far away. The older brother stayed. But his heart is not at home. His wrong assessment of himself. His heart is as far away in a far country. But although he was there physically. That's what happened when some Christians, you see them in church. You see them active, and yet, because of those spirits and those uh, uh, wrong motive in their heart, they're as far away as if someone who never went to church. So you see, the Bible said, you, you, you praise me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Remember that? So God sees the heart, remember. So if your body is in church, make sure your heart is also in church and your mind is also in church. So we see the reality, we see the resentment, the reality, and finally the remedy. What's the remedy? The remedy is how the father, uh, you know, came, came out, talked to the elder son. Notice what the father said. Okay? Now, the remedy is, how can I overcome this dreadful carnality? Now look, look at what the father said. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. That simple statement is the solution for healing uh, you know, a backslidden heart, a carnal believer. This will put you, you know, a straight in your path this will prevent you from being carnal in your ways even though you're a believer so how do you do that three things number one always think of your privilege he said son remember this when you feel you are down when you feel you're not treated fairly remember you are the son of God you are a child of God the God is your father. What a, what a privilege to have God as our father. Of all the billions of people in this world, only those few true believers in Christ can call God my father. Abba, father. Isn't that a privilege? So don't wallow in, in bitterness and, and, and look up. Just say, I am a child of God. Whatever happens it, it, you know, in this life, on this earth, I'm still a child of God. Not only that, think of your position. The father said, you are always with me. You are always with me. God is always with you. Now, the problem with the oldest son is this. He wants what the father can give. Give me a goat. Give me this. But he never thought that, hey, I always have the father with me 
Every night, every day, every morning when I wake up, I have the Father with me. So why would I, you know, uh, clamor for what He has when in fact I have Him? Isn't that what's important? You're always, you know, uh, desiring what God can give, how God can answer your prayer. When God is saying, Son, you have me. You're always with me and I'm always with you. That's the position that we have. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why worry on the things that whether I give it or not? When in fact, you have me. My son, you have me. And finally, think of your possessions. And all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. Wow. Every child of God owns everything that Jesus owns. You know that? We are co-heirs with Christ. Whatever Jesus owns, we own because we are in Christ. You cannot beat that, folks. There's no reason to be bitter. There's no reason to be angry uh, at how life treats you. There's no reason to be carnal in your thoughts, to be critical in your spirit, to be judgmental in your spirit. There's no reason because you are so blessed. So blessed. Don't be like the older son. And remember this, from the, since the story of the lost and found started, everybody was rejoicing. The shepherd was rejoicing when he found the sheep. He called his friends. They were all happy and rejoicing. The woman who found the coin was rejoicing. She called her neighbors and friends and said, Come, I found the coin that I've been looking for. They were all rejoicing with her. The lost son was rejoicing and and. The, the, all the servants in the household was rejoicing. The father was happy and rejoicing. You know what's happening? There's only one in the whole story that is not rejoicing. This older brother. This older brother. You know one way uh, to find out if you have been backslidden? You lost your joy of being a Christian. You lost your joy. That's why when King David said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. So friend, use this as a mirror. As a mirror. And, and, and look at yourself in that mirror. Are you the older brother? The lost sibling? You're in the church. You're active. But you could be as lost as anyone else. Again, may this message have uh, uh, blessed you and, and thank you for for uh, watching thank you for listening and the lord uh, bless you and keep you and i pray that you would have a wonderful weekend ahead and see you in our live stream uh, worship service on sunday uh, 11 o'clock uh, california time or, or pacific time and may the lord give you you know the, the blessings the 